now before you and mm -hmm. uh, everything going on there. Lord, I pray that um, whatever's going on, that you would uh, bring wisdom to the doctors yeah, sure. and bring realization of what needs to happen so that things can be done. Um, Lord, as we're going through tonight, uh, may be honoring to you, may we get through the material yes. quickly, but also so that it motivates us to share and be um, useful tools for you in that yes, sharing. Lord. So Lord, guide and direct us by your Holy Spirit that we may accomplish the things you have for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Alright, so um, I'm going to try to go through this quickly. I want to try to get through two sure. weeks tonight. Mm -hmm. Alright, so we're talking about Buddhism. So Buddha, he said, or it's attributed to him, the saying is, do not dwell in the past, do not dream of the future, concentrate the mind on the present moment. So you're going to kind of see the development of Buddhism and how this kind of comes out of Hinduism. So Buddha um, is actually a gentleman by the name of Siddhartha. Uh, what's interesting, in at least in... Uh, the Bay Area, there's actually a book that is required reading for high schoolers that deals with Siddhartha's life. And so, um, so it's interesting. The, the, his name, though, means king or savior. And the Buddha, the king or the savior. Um, uh, Siddhartha, I mean, the king or savior. Um, he left home because of pain and suffering. Remember when we talked about Hinduism? And how Hinduism has a caste system, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of pain, a lot of suffering in it. So Buddha is actually coming out of that. Siddhartha is coming out of that, that world of Hinduism. And he's seeing this pain and suffering. So like a lot of people, right, one of the biggest questions that I get asked is, why does God allow evil, right? Um, it's, it can be phrased, why do bad things happen to good people, right? Why is there pain and suffering in the world? Why, you know, why is the, um, the rapist get off? You know, all these different ways of asking the same question. Why is there pain and suffering in the world? And so Buddha actually basically asks that same idea. Okay? How so, did he get to be savior? That's just his name. So, like, a lot of people would name their children, yeah. um, oh, okay. you know, a name to reflect something. Um, one, one understanding of Buddha is that he comes from a royal background. Mm. Uh, so he's looking at Hinduism, right? And it doesn't work. And so the story goes that he goes under a tree for seven days and there he finds enlightenment. So he sits under this tree and finds enlightenment. And seven is a universal number for, um, for spiritual awakening, things like that, which is interesting, right? Because that... The, Seven is the biblical number of God, mm -hmm. right? So it's just one of those interesting things. Um, but, so what's interesting about this, remember, you have in Hinduism over 300,000 gods, right? And that's the modern number. So you have hundreds of gods, right, within, Buddha, uh, within Hinduism. So Buddha, through this enlightenment process, realizes or he says that there's no gods. Right? So he keeps the idea, and we'll see this later, he keeps the idea of Brahma, that idea, that cosmic force idea. Um, but he moves away from the idea of gods, in the case of Vishnu and Krishna and those types of deities. He rather just has this idea of, we can say the cosmic force, um, the universe type of thing, Brahma. Right, that idea that we talked about in Hinduism. What's interesting about this is that you um, you can come away with Buddhism with an understanding of atheism. Like there is an atheistic idea here um, within Buddha. Uh, the figurehead, of course, is the Buddha, the the original founder. Um, I just put in Dalai Lama there because that is a very popular person, especially in the '90s, right when. China was doing those things with Tibet, and so the Dalai Lama was everywhere, right? He was making rounds and things like that. And so the Dalai Lama is something that's in people's heads as a figurehead, even though he is a part of a subgroup called Tibetan Buddhism. Mm -hmm. um, 
But so their afterlife, they they have the same idea, right? So when we talked last week, we talked about karma and and this idea in Buddha in Buddhism. Sorry, in Buddhism, you still have this idea of this cycle of life and death, of this reincarnation cycle. And so you still have that within Buddhism. And you still have the way out, right? And that would be the nirvana. Okay? So that's the idea here. So you still have a lot of the same things that roll over from Hinduism into Buddhism. And really the the big takeaway, if you really want to make like the big things, is this idea of the you know, Brahma, right? You just take away the idea of the lesser gods. Okay, so there's just this now. There's just this this universal force. Um, yeah, force type of thing. Uh, rather than than um, uh, the different deities. Um, the worldview is technically pantheistic, right? In the sense of, because pantheism, if we remember, pan meaning all things, right? So it's pantheistic. All things are, and then the theistic, which is God. So all things are God, right? So that, it's technically a pantheistic religion. But what's interesting is it works very well in atheism. And so when you see, like when the communists, right, communism is atheistic. Mm -hmm. And so when you see the communists coming into North Korea, China, these places where Buddhism is very much a part of the society, mm -hmm. it, it takes hold very easily because you can have Buddhism and communism actually work really well together because it's it takes away the idea of gods and atheism is a godless belief system so it works really well in that sense um, and that's why really it caught hold so fast within those nations where uh, is that sorry yeah is that a question about Siddhar, Artha. Siddhartha yeah Siddhartha uh, did he uh, was he disillusioned with Hinduism? Yeah, right. yeah, because all, all the pain and suffering, right? That we okay, and yeah. he didn't see that God's doing anything. Yeah, about it. yeah, it it'd be the same thing as like an atheist would say, um, and we actually covered this in the next series, which is um, uh, Sam Harris says something along the lines of seeing all this suffering in the world that your God does not take care of. Yeah, it's the same idea. Um, type of thing. And that's why we see Buddha move away from the gods and just kind of embrace this universal type of force. Um, so we're, um, I think we're just now on page 60, 68, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so the sacred texts are the sutras, whoops, sorry, are the sutras. Um, yeah. So the, for, for you guys, Reincarnation, Nirvana, uh, afterlife, our worldview is pantheistic. Um, so, so the, their, their writings of wisdom, and there's there's a lot of these types of writings of wisdom in ancient China. So there's a, there's a lot. Um, but really, it's this idea of the inner, right? Looking inward, because now we're going to dispel things. One of the things we kind of talked about last week, just briefly, is the idea of meditation. Mm -hmm. So Eastern meditation is this idea of you you meditate, right? Um, you meditate for the purpose of emptying the mind, right? Like that's the purpose. It's, it's I need to get rid of whatever it is, right? This is this is the idea of Eastern meditation. Um, what uh, Christian meditation we say is is the filling up, yeah. right? We're filling up God's word, and so I always use the the uh, illustration of you take a cup of coffee, and Eastern meditation is just you dump it out, right? Well, 
when you dump it out, what do you have? Nothing. Nothing. You have nothing there. And so Jesus actually tells a parable of the demons, right? Yeah. They're, they're cast out. Mm -hmm. They go away. The guy cleans himself up, but it's empty. He doesn't replace it with anything. Mm -hmm. And so when the demons come back, he's worse off. Mm -hmm. So that's Easter meditation. When you, oh, when you release, right, when you get rid of whatever it is, what's there to replace it? That's the issue, right? Mm -hmm. And since we can't actually, you know, when we talk about the spiritual matters, I always akin it to a, um, a two-way mirror, right? That's right, right? Or is it a one-way mirror? The one where you can see on one side, one-way one mirror, right? Yeah. yeah. So the spiritual world is a one-way mirror. We can, all we see is the mirror. We see the physical world. On the other side, the spiritual world, they can see both sides. <laughs> and so we don't know who we're talking to, right? We... This is why it's really important for the believer to rely on the scriptures and rely on the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, so for Christian, it's a filling up. It's the coffee cup being poured into with the water of the word until everything's gone, right? All the, the sin, right? The coffee is gone. And we only have the clean water of Christ, of God's word in, in us. And so that's a difference in meditation. So this idea of look within, right, and this is actually something that um, for the Christian we have to be very careful with. Because, yeah, because scripture, like in Jeremiah, says the heart is deceptive, right? It's deceiving. And so when people say things like follow your heart, look within, your own truth, all these things go back to this look within type of thing. And it has a Buddhist idea here. You know, it's the answer to your questions, to the universal question, isn't found out there, it's found in here. And which is the reverse of Christian, Christianity, which is the, the creation declares the glory of the Lord, right? So you look out there. The Word points to Christ, so you look to the Word. It's the objective truth. And so within Buddhism, it's very subjective when we start talking about these different things. So, oops, sorry. Um, so, keep doing that. Um, so, worship temples is focusing more on this meditation type of things. That's where you get the gongs, the bells, all these different things that go along with it. And, you know, you might have seen rosaries, right? Like, um, Catholics have rosaries, um, Buddhists have prayer beads. So, it's prayer beads. So, yeah, if you think of a rosary, it's basically the same idea. And every bead, just like a rosary, has a uh, chant or a prayer that is associated with it. And so this is why you'll see them with these big things. Uh, I keep bringing up the, the show the Avatar of the Last Airbender because this is very much a part of that world. In fact, the main character comes from a very Tibetan style of Buddhism. And so they have the big prayer beads. And it's a part of their world. And so this idea of meditation is one of the main parts of how do we, we move on to nirvana, right? It's through this, this act of meditation. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll get into more. But well, what did they meditate on? Yeah, when we meditate, so, we meditate on the Bible. So you, you've heard those things it's like, um, what's the sound of one hand clapping? Like these yeah. little, these kind of riddles. Oh, okay. Um, if a tree falls in the forest, these types of, um, okay. we would call them um, illogical riddles, right? Because the idea there is, what's the sound of one hand clapping? Well, it, Nothing, right? Like, you need two hands to clap. So the purp purpose of it is to start thinking beyond what you think. And then as you're thinking through these, these, these different riddles, these different ideas, <coughs> right? And that's where you get kind of these, these sayings. Um, and they're, um, in our kind of world that we live in, they'll do things like Confucius, right? Because Confucianism, Confucianism is... Similar to Buddhism, but it's different. Um, but it's like a saying, 
And so you, you think on these ideas and then that's kind of freeing your mind. Where we talk about um, meditating on the word, mm -hmm. right? Which is, um, it's logical. It's life. It's, it, yeah, it's, it focuses on who God is, right? Brings us back to him. The riddles kind of bring you away from logic, away from the things of the world, so that you can, again, move beyond it, right? Because the, the idea is you're trying to break free of this life. So you need to not think on logical things because that is a part of this world. You start thinking of things that are, we would call them illogical. And so this is also why you can take Buddhism and actually mold it into what we call New Age, which is using other practices of like postmodern thought and things like that, which are these ideas of breaking loose of truth and um, modernity and all these different ideas. We'll go more into those a little later. But yeah, so it's, it's things like that. Um, burning incense, right? So the burning of incense isn't unique to Buddhism, to Hinduism, these things, because we actually see this in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But in the Old Testament, there's the purpose of it is to understand how um, it's supposed to represent the idea of um, uh, our prayers going up to God, or this idea of it's rising, so it, it has a purpose behind it. This is to help you focus on whatever that real is, whatever that thing you're meditating on. Yeah. Yeah. Also, yeah, yeah. There's some over here, and we just oh, oh. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's awful stuff. Um, it can cover bad smells too. So, oh. um, <laughs> but so the uzo, uzo it, yeah. I don't. I'm not good. With uzo. Um, yeah. But that's that necklace. That's the yeah. So, um, and then things like bells, right? The the chiming of a bell, that kind of <coughs> un, uh, monotonous. You know, kind of just this. Oh yeah, I heard that. Yeah, every once in a while, it's just to to keep you in this state of meditation. Um, um, I just I want to interject just real quick. We watched a at, at length video on Indian practices called Kundalini mm. and they showed a group of 200 people uh, being and they were all dancing frantically like like this and mm -hmm. like this and all of a sudden it was dead quiet no movement whatsoever and that point the idea was to empty your your mind yeah. open yourself up to and, and that's a carryover. So the Buddhists, the way, why they do it, it's a carryover from Hinduism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This idea of, again, it's all about releasing getting past, you know, into the, the universe and nirvana. Like, yeah. And so the emptying is major, a part of pantheistic religions in the oh, East. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Oops. Um, you would be interested in it. Uh, so the burning of incense, um, the view of prayer, and it goes okay. Um, and then these two, meditation, and those are the puzzles that we were talking about. Kulan? Yeah, Kulan. Kulan. Um, those, th so these are what the puzzles are. So, and there's a ton of different ones. Puzzles, I understand. Yeah, pu like a riddle. Oh. Yeah, in that sense. It's, it's a riddle. So a puzzle in the sense of it's for your mind to kind of... <laughs> Unpack. Now, I have seen actual pu like puzzle boxes that, um, that I've seen from the East of the world, but it's it's more of like the mind trying to unlock, right? Hmm. And so that's what we're talking about is these these mind riddles types of things. Uh, geographic center would be India, China, but mostly China, right? But it's, it's really these kind of, it's the Eastern, that's why if, if you ever look in a book about world religions, and it'll say Eastern pantheistic religions, because this is mainly in the East. Uh, because when you start moving West, the pantheistic idea of everything is God really isn't there, right? You kind of see this in animistic religions, um, where everything's kind of a part of the world, 
but it's not on the same level as the pantheist theory. Well, those are huge population centers. Right. Why isn't Buddhism higher in population? Well, I mean, I mean, if you think about it, like in China, yeah. China, we're talking over a billion people, that's and most of them are. So that's why. But you also have to remember, so if we're in the Western world, right, and from basically Pakistan, right, which is the border, mm -hmm. we'll say the border of uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, those, those areas right there, Iraq, that's kind of the border between Eastern and the Western world, even though we call it Middle East, right? But from there on, monotheism was the, the main thing. So Islam, right, at about, um, I think Islam somewhere around 1 point something billion people. Uh, Christianity, uh, 2 point something billion people. So just with those two, you're talking about almost 4, mil 4 billion people, half the population of the world believe in that. You go to the other side, and a, a billion people believe in Buddhism. You know, over a billion people believe in Hinduism. So just with four belief systems, you almost cover the entire world. Mm -hmm. So they, there is a lot. Um, and where Christianity is two billion people worldwide, something like Buddhism is like a billion people almost centered in just that region of, of, the, of Asia. Uh, so it's a very different... And with Christianity, it's go out, right, and evangelize, share the gospel, go to the unreached people. There's nothing like that in Buddhism. There's nothing like that in Hinduism. The only thing that's similar is in, is in Islam, but that is a, a war. Yeah. Like, you carry it. Yeah, it's a holy war. So it's a very, Christianity is unique in that sense of peaceful evangelism. Um, where Buddhism isn't really evangelistic in, hey, you need to believe this. Because it goes back to Hinduism. Hinduism is everything's a part of this belief system. It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter who you believe in because it's just a part of this. It gets you to this idea of the cycle. In a sense, Buddhism just carries that on into it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, at this time, we we're talking like 300 million. Now it's because of the explosion in population. So this is, this number is very old. <laughs> yeah. Um, but basically, they convert their own truck, their own. Yeah, because, and this is another thing that's um, unique to Christianity. You are a Christian, like I was talking to one person, right? And we have this kind of this idea in Christianity God has no grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Right? He only has children, meaning that you have to choose. So my kids, even though they're pastor kids, they're not going to be Christians unless they choose Christ. Right? Mm -hmm. You're not born into Christianity. Where in these other religions, you're born into it. Yeah, that's right? they mean to. You're a Hindu because you're born into Hinduism. Mm -hmm. You're a Buddhist because you're born into Buddhism. And so that's a huge thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um and that's, you know, so, um, yeah. Uh, some important vocabulary that uh, you would just need to know. Nirvana, a state of being without su uh, suffering beyond this life. So the big thing in Buddhism is suffering. You don't want to cause suffering. So why, why do you not step on the ant? Because that cause, causes suffering. Um, whereas Christians, we would say, uh, we take care of it because we are stewards yeah. of it. Um, the Buddhists say, well, that is a thing of suffering, and we don't cause things to suffer. And so we need to move beyond suffering, right? And so this is, so what is, for, for the Christian, pleasure is, there's two types of pleasure, right? There's pleasure that mm -hmm. indulges sin, and there's pleasure that is glorifying to God. Mm -hmm. And so I can, I can uh, paint 
something and bring glory to God, or I can paint something and bring um, about sin, right, in someone's life. And so we look at pleasure as pleasure is good, right, as long as it's within the glorifying of God context. For the Buddhists, pleasure actually can lead to suffering, right? Because, okay, so if we're talking about husband and wife, if the husband has pleasure um, in another woman, that causes suffering to the wife, so you shouldn't do that. Where we would say, no, that's sin, right? That's a non-commitment. And so that idea, so pleasure, sin, when we talk about sin, we have to understand that in the context of a Buddhist, sin isn't sin, right? But we can talk about it in the sense of suffering, right? The things you do will cause suffering. Okay, the God of the scriptures calls that sin, right? But not all pleasure is bad because God created this world. This is a big thing too. When we talk about um, in the ancient world, um, and we've hit on this a couple of times, you have this idea of the Gnostic, right? Their belief was that um, the Demiurge, um, Demiurge um, was a god of creation in the sense of the physical realm. And the and Jesus was the true God and he was the spiritual God okay the idea here and this comes from Greek philosophy is that Jesus creates the spiritual world and that's us right but the demiurge encapsulates it or confines it to physicality so Jesus has to come because he's going to break out um, us from the, the physical world right this is why when you start reading through those smaller letters they'll say something like um, uh, Jesus came in the flesh like that's a huge thing so when John says in John 1 the word He's using very much logos. He's using very much um, this Greek idea of, of logos. But then he says logos becomes flesh. Right? And it's in part to deal with this, this proto-gnosticism that's going around. Um, we can think of that in the same way with Buddhism. Buddhism has this... So in this, they, they these Gnostics hate the physical world because it, it's evil. In a sense, Buddhism has that same idea. The physical world is bad. We have to break free of it. And so it's, it's really this idea when Genesis 1 is such an important passage because it says when God creates, he creates it good. Right? The physical world is good. The issue is sin. And so this becomes a a hard thing for them. Like we, when we talk about pantheism, it's hard for Western minds to wrap their head around that kind of this universal deity, but not really a deity, right? For an Eastern worldview, it would be hard to understand why is the world good? Because all we see is suffering, right? And so this becomes a huge thing, and sharing the gospel with someone that views the world as something to escape, not something to be okay with. Right? And so that's, that's a huge thing. So that idea of nirvana. Uh, Dharma, you can uh, kind of think of it as the Ten Commandments type of stuff. The law. Right? These are the things that uh, Buddha teaches to do and don't. And we'll, we'll cover, I think, I think we covered some of them. Uh, whoops, sorry. Yeah, we covered Dharma. Um, but before we get there, just one last vocabulary. Karma. We've already talked about that in Hinduism. It carries over into Buddhism. That idea of cause and effect. Okay. So.
So, so that's just, again, it's just one of those carry-ons from before. I'm lost here. Um, you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, I think oh, it's, I oh, yeah, oh. we're at the very top, yeah. Right. Yeah, so karma cause and effect. All right. Um, so this is the Dharma, okay? And what you'll notice is there's some similarities between the Ten Commandments and Dharma. Okay? And this is actually something that atheists will bring up um, when they talk about, oh, see, they have their own style of Ten Commandments. But it's not the Ten Commandments. Okay? Like, I, but it, we can kind of just think of it in that way. So let's start off with these two. All is suffering. So let's let's step back for a moment and just compare this to the Ten Commandments. What is the first command? Love, 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 love. Right? No. love the Lord your God. Love. It should be love. Um, love the Lord your God. Right? So let's. Heart, soul, mind, soul. Okay. So let's go. We're going to. So when we talk about Ten Commandments, we usually are referencing um, Exodus twenty. And so we go to Exodus 20, and here we go. And the Lord spoke these words, right? I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. Okay? You shall, this is the first you shall, you shall have no other gods before me. So it's, and what's interesting about this, the first, the first four, right? The first four are about relationship with God. It's, have no other gods before me, no <laughs> idols, right? It's Sabbath. It's this idea of there's a relationship between us and God. Afterwards, it's our relationship with each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, here we start off with the Four Noble Truths. All is suffering. Very different, right, than I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. And so where it's relational here, it's it's the hurt. And you can almost, I mean, you see this, right? Because Buddha came out of hurt. And so what does he say? Everything hurts, right? Mm -hmm. All this suffering. And suffering, how is suffering, how does that come about? It's caused by cravings. Our, our desires cause suffering. Our desires for money, for wealth, for food, for necessities, right? And it's interesting, so if you take like Matthew 6, where, it taught, where it's the Lord's Prayer, right? Jesus is teaching how to pray. And he starts out with relation, right? Heavenly, um, our Father who art in heaven, right? Hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, right? That's relational. God always starts with, it's you and me, right? It's God and you type of thing. Through that, where do we go? To our desires, right? Give us our day, this daily bread, right? Forgive us our trespasses, right? The, this relation, so it's, I need, I need, I need bread, right? And so God takes care of that. And so, but in Buddhism, it's this suffering that is the focus. It's the hurt and the pain. And I don't know about you, but how often I see that in people's lives, mm -hmm. right? Is it always starts with the hurt and with the pain. And sometimes you have to deal with that. That's why the first question a lot of people ask is why do bad things happen mm -hmm. to good people? It's because they need to deal with suffering. They need to deal with hurt. God wants to deal with relational. It's mm -hmm. sin, hurt between you and I. Once you get that grasp, now you can understand how to go mm -hmm. through suffering. Now you mm -hmm. can understand how to deal with cravings. So you can't really deal with those things until you have that relationship fixed. And that's the big thing. Did you, did you want one of these? Um, we're on page uh, 69. Alright. So yeah, four noble truths. First one is all is suffering. Second one, it's our cravings and desires that lead to suffering. Okay? Alright. Uh, continuing down, next one, suffering can end, right? So there, so there's hope. And that's the big thing that, okay, so there's hope. There always has to be hope, right? Um, and so for Buddhists, it's, look, all the suffering, our cravings, our desires go over suffering, 
but there's hope, right? Suffering can end. So how do you do that? Yeah, I was gonna ask. Yeah, more rules. Okay. Right? So this is one thing that's big for us as Christians. How do how does suffering we can agree with this so far? Suffering is a part of the world, right? Mm -hmm. What causes suffering? It's sin, or sin. we can say cravings, desires, right? There's an end to suffering. We agree with that. How does the Christian say? Suffering ends through the cross. Like that's how suffering ends. Because once you do that, then it's okay, suff sin has been dealt with. And now I can actually go through suffering with joy. Which is why, right? Like it is something that is not what you want to hear. Like no one wants to hear rejoice in all things. You know, no one wants to say, yes, bring on the suffering, right? But when you have that relationship fix, suffering becomes a secondary thing because there's greater things ahead, right? There's eternal purposes. Yeah, because it's part of the fallen world. It's right. Not part of anymore. Right. And so the, the cross takes care of this, this need to not suffer. But if you don't have the cross, you have to find ways of dealing with suffering. Right. Well, I so, think a better word to use than joy is hope. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you, hope. You've got, uh, through the suffering, you know, you've got the hope of, well, the bottom line is, hey, I know where I'm going. Right. But joy, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be joyful when I've got a migraine headache. Well, joy and happiness are two different things. Well, yeah. yeah. But you said joy. Yeah, but happy. because it says rejoice in all things. That's, that's joy. Yeah. You are to have joy in all things. Yeah. And so it's saying, it, joy is not, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> That's not what joy is. Joy is, I have hope. Yeah. Therefore, the suffering, I can deal with that. Because this is momentary and not. So that, that's the difference. Which yeah. is like the basis of peace. <clears throat> yeah. So that, that's, your peace is the hope and the joy. Right. <clears throat> yeah, the peace and suffering. The last thing you want to hear, though, when you're suffering, is smile. You know, right. just makes you want to punch because, the person in the face. Because that's that's the happiness idea. Mm -hmm. Like you're supposed to be happy in all things. That's not what the scripture says. Mm -hmm. It says to rejoice in all things. The because so Paul would associate um, suffering with being in Christ. So when we go through suffering, it's if you go through, we talked about this with Peter, if you go through suffering because of Christ, that's a good thing. If you're going through suffering because you did it, because you sinned, that's pointless. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy, it's, it really is crazy to think that you would be happy about having cancer or, you know, right. whatever. But, but I think for anybody who's, I'm sure people here have all walked through something there's a closeness with God that can that can come while you're suffering that you don't know any other way. Right. And there's sometimes there's sometimes I look back on those times in my life and I you know it's I could almost and I have to use that word, almost wish that it could return so I could have that same closeness with God and. I mean, not that you can't. I mean, but I'm just saying, when you're suffering, there is that special closeness with God if you choose to walk with Him through it. And I think that's the joy. Yeah, that's the that's joy. What you're saying that's right. the yeah. Well, the thing of the of the scripture mm -hmm. says, "For the joy set before Him, yeah. Jesus yeah. endured the cross." The cross. Mm -hmm. Right. So obviously there was something set before him. The promises. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That we could see his the result of his suffering. Right. And that's not to say that you have to enjoy it. No, it's a very right. different thing. Yeah. It's yeah. It's attitude too. Mm -hmm. huh. It's an attitude. Right. And this look is, at it. Right. And so when Jesus is in the garden, he's not enjoying the suffering. Mm -hmm. Right. But he endured. Scripture, he endured it, and in because of that, 
on the other side of the cross, we are his joy. Like he kept yeah. his eyes yeah. on the prize. Right. Kept his eyes on the joy set before him. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why we got to keep our eyes set Love on the promises. Yeah. Right. And on God and right. his word. So um, let's go through the eightfold path. Um, so this is what a lot of people say looks like the Ten Commandments. Right understanding of reality, right thought, right speech, right actions. Notice something in this. You have to have it all right. Does that make sense? Like, this is, so when we, last Sunday when we talked about, um, you know, there's the narrow path, right? But all that it takes to get onto the narrow path is one thing, right? It's the acceptance of Christ. It's realizing I'm a sinner and accepting Jesus. That's all it takes to go from the wide path to the narrow path. It's not about having a perfect theology. Like, that's not what gets you, you know, on salvation. But in Buddhism, in these types of religions, because it's work-based, it has to be the right way of thinking. So understanding the right reality, wrong, right? All is suffering, right? Those are the right views of reality. Right thought, okay, my desires, right, are the problem. I need to abstain from things. Um, we can actually do this in Christianity where we're like, oh, uh, to be a better Christian, I need to just not eat that, or not watch that, or not, you know, nots, nots, nots. And to actually be a, a better Christian is to say, okay, Jesus, what do you want me to do? Amen. Like, that's the difference. Legalism is the binding of, I just have to do these rules, and then I'm acceptable to God. Grace says you're already acceptable to God because of what Jesus did. Now you fall on his grace, his feet, his lap, and you say, okay, Jesus, how... I know I'm not supposed to be disrespectful of my parents, right? How do I walk in that? Like, how do I actually do that in a way that is pleasing towards you? Because Titus, it, uh, Titus is a good book for that because it teaches you how to do good for God. Right. Um, willingly and happily. Right, yeah, and it has to be from this willing spirit, right? Not a, oh, I got to do this because if not, God's going to be mad at me. Exactly. Yeah, it's the yeah, it's the attitude, it's the realization of where is this coming from, and how do I move forward in it? And in this, it's the what I have to say the right things, I have to do the right actions, I have to think the right thoughts, and it's all on me. And there's no transformation, right? Where in Christianity, it has to come through a transformation. And how does that happen? Well, part of that is being washed by the Word. It's Filling up, and it always comes back to that. Filling up, the meditation, one's empty, one's filling up, type of thing. And so, so those are the first four. The next four are right occupation. So you actually have to be in the right business. So if you're in the business of cutting it down all the trees, guess what? You're not in the right occupation, right? And so, in a sense, you can kind of think about that in. Um, there are occupations for the Christian. There are occupations that lead to more sin, but for the, for the generally, there's not those occupations, right? Yeah. Yeah, but um, living in Tibet, you have someone whose occupation it is to slaughter the animals. Yeah. And because of that, their karma is going to be bad. Right. The cause and effect. Right. So next time around in reincarnation, they're going to have a lower standard. Right. They're going to have a worse life. Right. And so that's how that practically for them could work out, the right, right occupation. Right. And, and in that case, it's they did something bad, so they got that because position. Because they slaughtered, yeah. Right. So they got the position of slaughtering. And now they're in, so it's a, a continual thing. Now they have to work their way back up. Yeah. But it sounds like it's a downward spiral. I don't know how they work their way back up. Well, yeah. because it's just because now that they got that, now they're going to be in a, a lower position. Right. So now, now you can start working your way back up. Mm -hmm. 
Because Hopefully you'll get something better next time around. Yeah. But. What do you mean, like, their karma that in their religion? Yeah, yeah. karma. So that caused, like, yeah. Oh, I didn't put it up. In, in, in America, we usually use, use the word karma like my fate. Yeah. But that's not how they use it. It's, oh. it's what you've done. And now it's my karma is almost like, well, this is what's been allotted to me because of my former life. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, because they believe in the second right. reincarnation. So, right. Yeah, so every time you do a bad action, that adds to it and can lead you to that lower state. Oh. And so you need to do good action, right? And that's through these different things, what you say, what you do, things like that. And then that brings you to a higher state. Does that make sense? Okay. That, that's karma. Mm -hmm. But it's almost as if it's the universe itself that's doing, yeah. is, is placing the yeah. positions, yeah. not yeah. yeah, it's it's a part of this, mm -hmm. but basically it's it's in a sense, um, giving like money. So you kind of think of this: like everyone has a bank, and when you do good, you put stuff in the bank. When you do bad, you take bad stuff. When you take it out of the bank, and if the bank is lower, right or empty. That's when you go low, but it's, if it's higher, that's when you go good, in a sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, it just seems like almost a, like a cause and effect. Yeah, yeah. well, it Basically is basically a cause that's, and effect, but it's t not tied so much with a god like I think. Right, personal. Saying. Yeah, it's more the universe. Right. You know, yeah. like the cosmos. Right, and so when we when um. When we put down karma in your notes, it's karma, cause, and effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what it is. And I've so had, I've had a lot of Christians just lately um, say, "Oh, God has blessed me so much," and they're talking about the material things mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and almost as like a karma thing, like they've done so. And that know? that's a problem. Karma actually can. I've talked to Christians that have a karma idea and that's not something new that like I said a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. Job is a karma type of mm -hmm. theology that they're dealing with so when Job comes into the situation he has everything right and when everything's taken away he doesn't understand mm -hmm. why is everything being taken away I'm a good God right mm -hmm. and we know he is mm -hmm. like even God so the reason why we know he's a, a good guy right righteous guy is because God said it so at the very beginning, even before we get to Job, we already know that Job is a righteous man. So when he gets taken away, that subverts the idea of what you do is what makes you a righteous man, right? But his friends are the karma guys. Yeah. You must have done something wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. Therefore, God is punishing you. That's a karma idea, right? In a biblical context using God as kind of the punishment. <laughs> this is why we go through the whole thing and this is why Job actually never gets an answer. Right. It's it's not because God doesn't re-bless him, right? Because he re bless him. But Job never gets the answer because it's not for Job. When we go through suffering, it's not necessarily we're going to get the answer we want. Why did all this happen? It's Job is written for us. Yeah. Right? God hasn't walked through this for us. And Jesus is still dealing with this when he is teaching. And he has to say, they, the um, disciples come to him and say, see that guy over there? Why is he Why is he blind? Is it his sin or is his mom or dad? Right? It's that karma idea. Right. And what does Jesus respond? None of these is for the glory of God. It's for, in other words, it has nothing to do with anything they've done, mm -hmm. the karma idea. There are purposes beyond our understanding, or your understanding in that case. And so, but we still do it as Christians. If there's anything similar in Christianity, it would be the, the truth about reaping and sowing. Yeah. But, yeah, not the, etern in the eternal sense. Or yeah, and in that sense... Um, Jesus actually deals with that whole idea too. Mm -hmm. And using, uh, in the context,
context he's using the, the gospel. We plant, we water, but then he says it's God who makes it grow. And so it has nothing to do, the results have nothing to do with you. That's on God, whatever he wants, whatever he desires. But it's not, you know, you, you do this. But it does come back to the idea of, yeah, if you do bad things, like, mm -hmm. there, there are consequences right. to those bad actions. But it's not as if God's going, okay, are you doing good or are you doing bad? Right. It's not the, yeah. 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 It's, no, it, there are natural consequences to things. Right. Like walking in the street, you know, in a rush hour. Like, those are natural consequences. And if we don't have wisdom, right, we're going to just mm -hmm. take ourselves out of the gene pool. <laughs> right? Like, that's, mm -hmm. that's not karma, though. Because mm -hmm. karma is a universal thing, right? Mm -hmm. the, the temporary things have universal consequences. Where when we talk about universal consequences, we're talking about sin. Like, but that's rebellion against God. And that's a judgment that doesn't happen until the you die. Mm -hmm. Right? And at any time, you can actually change your destiny. And all it takes is, I'm a sinner, Jesus saved. Like, if you want to think about it like that. It's not a done deal. Um, yeah. It's not predetermined, in a sense. So, okay, let's... We're not going to get through both of them like I want. Alright. Um, so right occupation, right effort. You're doing everything with good motivation, good intentions, right? Good in the sense of uh, following a four, four fold path. Um, right meditation, right? Doing the right things at the right times. Right concentration. This is the, just the degrees of meditation. Like you're growing in your meditation. So this is where you can see where... Um, uh, monks have petrified themselves, like these are or they don't move for so long that they actually die and they mummify themselves just by dying. Now, I mean, it's not mummifying in the sense of the Egyptian, but just they decompose because they died right there because they meditated for so long. Like, so it's the degrees of meditation. Um, now, here's some basic beliefs of how things happen around us. The world evolved. This is why I say Buddhism and, and atheism really work hand in hand. Like, you can be a Buddhist atheist because there's a lot of overlap here. There's no gods. The world evolved. This is more, um, more modern. Uh, no God, right? I already said that. Uh, love of all, right? Humans and animals, right? This idea. This is a very humanistic thing, which plays into atheism. Um, we need to love each other. We need to do right by each other. That's a humanistic um, turn of the, the 19th century, uh, not 19th, 20th century type of, we're all in this together, right? This is, um, uh, I think, is Harris? I think it's either Harris or Lennon. One of those two. Uh, George John Harrison. Lennon. George Harrison. Um, John Lennon. That song, um, We Are, is it, oh, We Are the World. Um, what if, you know, what if there was no wars? Yeah, beautiful. Imagine. Yeah, it's a beautiful song. Yeah. That's all you really listen yeah, to. It's, yeah, it's all about, and then you start, yeah, all the world coming together type of thing. Yeah. That's because they're bringing from the Eastern world. Mm -hmm. Right. They dabbled in that yeah. deeply. Right. What if there's no religions? Because Buddhism actually isn't a religion. Like it, it's not technically a religion. It's more of a philosophy than it is a religion. Uh, we just incorporate that because it has a lot of religious aspects. Um, but if you listen to that song, what if there was no religion? Mm -hmm. Right. What if? Religion too. What if there's heaven no was heaven. just no. right? But there's no heaven, no religion, too. Right. Uh, it's this very humanistic, we can gather together now. Yeah, yeah. Right? And that's kind of, we see that in Buddhism. And we see it because it also comes from this, this pantheistic idea. So where Harris and them, they go in, they, they start meeting with these, um, these gurus and things like that from Hinduism. You start seeing these, these 
um, ideas within their music, and it's very pantheistic in that sense. Um, you separate yourself from the things this world that brings about desire. This is actually works really well in the Asian culture because Asian cultures are shame based, right? They're a shame based culture because if you are doing anything that shames your family, that goes against all this, right? So you need to separate yourself. So now you become, and now this, where communism fits so well into these cultures is because you need to be a good citizen of the state, right? So this idea from Buddhists, separate yourself from the things that would have your own desire. Now you have communists saying, you know what's good for society is to be a good citizen. Your desire, that way you separate yourself from your desire, but for the desire of the state. This is why communism fits so well with Buddhism. Is it takes those things because it's humanistic and says perfect. So Christianity says you lay down your will right. for God's will. Right. Above um, the it's not another human beings or some governmental right. right. It's beyond that. And that's why it doesn't work well with communism. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, so Christianity is this radical, you know, really radical idea for the human heart. Um, so some other things that you can kind of just fit in here. Um, and this is interesting. This is what I always found interesting about these, these things. Um, don't wear jewelry, right? The prayer beads are something different. Um, but Buddhism has radically changed over the centuries. Like radically changed. Because going back just real quick, no gods, right? Like that is a core mm -hmm. of Buddha. But Buddha is a god mm -hmm. within the yeah. belief system. He is a god. Mm -hmm. They have idols. Oh. Tons of idols, right? So over time, it has radically changed from Buddha's original thoughts. And so when we're talking about these things, like people will say things like the church changed who Jesus was. Jesus never believed he was God. This is the, the thought. Jesus never believed he was God. The church made him a God. Except when you start reading and start understanding language, when he says things like, I am the resurrection, I am the life, right? Those are very heavily Old Testament themes and language that God used of himself. And so Jesus believed he was God. And so when the church says Jesus is God, they're just saying, Jesus said he was God, so we're saying he's God. Where in Buddhism, Buddha's like, reject all gods. Reject these idols. Why? Because he comes out of Hinduism, and Hinduism with the caste systems and things like that were the issues. And so he says, reject all those things. But over time, his followers have deified him, have brought back in those idols. Now, from a Christian perspective, we can go, I know why. Because the human heart desires to worship something. Mm -hmm. God creates us to worship. And so we can't not have something to worship. This is really interesting because um, there are stories of, um, of within communism in places like Russia, the Eastern Bloc and things like that, where the church was very, very um, influential, right? Communism comes in. And so once communism it falls, right, the USSR falls, um, people will start asking um, about faith. And the Russians, the Ukrainians, these people in these countries would say, we always believed in Jesus. Like we always were Christians. It's just we couldn't say anything because of the communists. Why? Because the human heart still desires to worship. So it doesn't, didn't matter that the communists were saying, you know, we'll kill all the Christians. And so, but for Buddhists, the human heart still desires to worship. And so what it does is it uses Buddhism to express that. Buddha is now God. We use idols of Buddha. And I always found that fascinating. The, the, the 
change to what we see in modern day Buddhism. And we actually see different sects, right, of, of Buddhists throughout the world. <laughs> Um, but it's just one of those things I always found interesting. The difference between Buddhist teachings and the actual practice of modern day Buddhists. Mm -hmm. It's very different. Yeah. Right? What about when was yoga created? That's, in, that's Hinduism. Isn't Hinduism Buddhism? Same no. Thing? No. no. It, it's similar, but it's different. Hinduism yeah. has a lot of gods. Yeah, they yeah, actually embrace the so idea of confused. gods. Yeah, there's so many. Yeah, they embrace the ideas of many gods. Okay. But Buddha rejects that idea. Well, it, it's almost atheistic. Like it's right on the, the the cusp of atheism, but because they believe in the same idea of a of a universal force, something that's beyond us, mm. that's influencing, they're not quite there. Okay. So. Uh, you're not supposed to pray to the Buddha, like that's the original idea, but now you have, you do. And that's again one of those things that I find very interesting. And there's a, a type of tithe, right? I, I use that loosely, just to, oh. like, like you have to get, like that's a part of it. You want to share something? <laughs> you can just the the monks. Stacks of money going into the banks. Yeah. Stacks of it. Because yeah. that, that's a part of it. Where we talk about, like, this is the thing that um, when we talk about tithing in Christianity, like, tithe actually comes from um, the idea of first fruits, this first fruits principle that we see in um, Cain and Abel. Like, it comes from that, like, giving the best that you have. Like, that's where tithe comes from. And then we see Abraham give a tithe, right? It was the first fruits of the battle, like, because it was a first fruits principle. Mm -hmm. Then we get into the law, and God enshrines in, and we have to understand this, he enshrines in a society, right? Because that's what the, the covenant is. It's a societal agreement of tithing. Understand that when you, what do you bring? You bring the first fruits, and this is what you are supposed to do. To be my people, you always bring the first fruits. So it's enshrined as tithe, right, which is 10%. Fast forward to the New Testament, tithe returns to first fruits principle. So now we give our cheerful, our cheerfully giving. Mm -hmm. And that's where, now the word tithe is more of just a, a way of saying first fruits. So when I tithe, I'm giving cheerfully back to God. That might be 2%, that might be 20%. That's the, the percentile isn't important. It's the first fruits. And it's the first fruits between us and God cheerfully, right? It's, not, it's never a have to. I never have to give. I give out desire for what God has done. Like that's what we're talking about. In societies like this, though, and, and most actually religions, right? We see this in uh, Islam, we see this in Mormonism, we see this in Buddhism. This idea of in order for salvation, whatever that looks like, right? Nirvana and so on. Oh, oh, that's okay. It's just about. You know. yeah. They always hang out yeah. on their way to different places. He's not going to attack you. It's okay. Yeah. You used to have them dive bomb us in the barn. Like, like the was a pet bird. That's funny. Um, so these, They're just so to give you, what? They're so tiny. Yeah, um, so just to let you know, uh, I'm going to close that door before you come back in. Um, he, so this guy, these, this, there's a family of them. Uh, they always come about this time as they travel. Really? They migrate. Um, and so they'll, every single... Uh, about end of January to March to come through hmm. and they, they stay up in the, the attic the and they go through, yeah, so anyway, yeah, anyway. I'm glad he's still alive yeah, yeah I, one year some people try to like hurt him, I don't like, I've said this before I don't like hurting things that don't need to be hurt, yes uh, you know, there's no, there, there's no purpose no all right, so here are some of these sets that we had talked about. Um, the Theravadas, this is the original 
Buddhists. They're the ones that are going to be hold to the truest teachings of Buddha. Um, the Mahayana um, would be like the one that most people will encounter in the Eastern world is this one, the Mahayana, this type of Buddhism in, the, in China and Japan. This is the one that has deified, right? Mm -hmm. This is the one that does a lot of the idols. Um, where the Ther Theravada, they're not going to do as much as that. But as we progress away from that, you're going to see that more and more, right? Zen Buddhism, that's what most popular, uh, the terminology we <coughs> hear, that's an Americanized version. It's like taking Chinese food. Oh, okay. right. It's it's that Americanized version of Buddha. They had a Zen, um, I don't know, worship place or something <coughs> on the way up to our camp. Yeah. It had a sign for Zen something yeah. camp, and I'm like right next to that. And so you know how I get super weird. I get super <laughs> weird. Well, the first church service, everybody's wild and crazy, and then the guy's up there, and he's like, "Calm down, wait, Zen," and I'm like. <laughs> yeah, because it's become colloquially a, a, a um, an idea of peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? like that in our I culture. Yeah, in our culture, it's peace, like it's calm. Serenity. Yeah, serenity, this very relaxed type of thing. But that's what in our American idea we have changed Buddhist Buddhism into an American form, which is in Buddhism. Yeah. And then the one that is very popular this one we talked about with the Dalai Lama is the Tibetan style of, of it where there is this reincarnation of a specific group guru right mm -hmm. and that's the Dalai Lama and this is actually when we look at um, again going back to that avatar the last airbender because that's something that if you have grandkids they actually might be watching the, the um, new Netflix series that is coming out. It's making a resurgence, this, this thing. That's one of the reasons why I bring it up. Um, it's, the avatar is basically a Tibetan style of Buddhism. Right. So it's a part of that. Because he is the reincarnation of <laughs> past avatars and kind of this idea. And so, but those are just kind of some of the sects that are out there. So what's the goal? Enlightenment, right? The nirvana, that's the goal. To break free of all this. Break free of suffering and everything. Um, so no more suffering. Like, that's the goal. Oops, sorry. Um, so this is kind of the big goal. Where, within Christianity, it's to know the Lord. Right? That's the goal. Right? And to be known by Him. And that, that knowing is personal relationship. That's why we see that throughout Scripture, it's all about the personal relationship. So what is theirs? Theirs is no more suffering and enlightenment. No more suffering. Yeah, no more suffering and enlightenment. But that's the goal. Some people will say that nirvana is a state of joy, but others say nirvana is a state of nothingness. Yeah, nothing. Which right. goes along with Buddhism because they believe that pleasure leads to suffering. Right. That's why the state of nothing. It's like you're blank. Right. Just blank. Right. It's not giving any good into the world. It's not taking any or <coughs> not any bad into the world. So you're in this completely. And this is actually what will eventually lead into Taoism. Like Taoism comes out of this idea because a perfect yin and yang of the world type of thing where you're not too good, you're not too bad, but everything is in balance kind of comes out of this Eastern pantheistic idea. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, we don't really talk about that, but. Um, some celebrities you might know, Phil Jackson, who was, you know, the, the coach of the Bulls and the Lakers, he was all the actor. Uh, Richard Gere, very Tibetan, very Tibetan Buddhist. He's the one that kind of brought in this idea of Hey, the Dalai Lama, and he would meet with him, you know, during the, the, the Chinese issues. Um, oops. Um, so how do you, oops, okay, let's go back. Um, how do you become a Buddhist? You just start following the teachings, so the fourfold path, or the full, yeah, the fourfold, the eightfold path. You just start following those things. It's not, almost, 
every single religion um, says you just start doing the work, right? Yeah. In Christianity, we say you have there has to be that moment of justification, that mm -hmm. acceptance of Christ. That that is the moment. The following comes afterwards, mm -hmm. right? That stuff and growing comes afterwards, but there has to be that moment. And so, very different how do you get on. And that's why the wife path is whatever you want. Kind of shows the workspace because if you're following something you don't know, you're just doing it on your own strength because you want to do it and it's your works. And then with Christianity, it's like we follow Jesus because we know him, we know what he's done for us, and we love him. Right. That's why there has to be that knowing way. Right. You can't say, well, I've always been. Right. Yeah. You know, for a Christian. You, you know, there has to be that time mm -hmm. of recognition of your need and right. choosing. Right? I don't know. Marika is never, she doesn't remember accepting him. She just knows what she has. Been in love. But okay. she has an acknowledgement of her need. Yeah. And yeah. somewhere she's made that choice to follow. Yes, yeah, somewhere right? along the somewhere way. Along, it doesn't have to be a prayer. It doesn't have to be, right. you know, it, like we we have, we've made the prayer this important mm -hmm. almighty yeah. thing right. that you don't even find in scripture. Right. It's, uh, it's that acknowledgement and a choice, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. Paul said it this way. He said, once you believe, you're sealed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's a, it's a big thing. Uh, okay, so how is it the same? Good morals, right? <laughs> Buddhists usually have good morals, especially um, this is why Confucianism becomes such uh, easily integrated into um, the Chinese world because of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. um, because you're a good person, right? You're you're mm -hmm. not in the sense of good. We're talking morals here, but in the sense of you're good for the state, you're good for the community type of thing. You're not a bad person, yeah. right? You're not the the evil one. And I think that's why people, like in Western society, will choose, like, it's a really popular thing to follow Buddha, you know, Buddhism, but because of the good morals and peace, and in that way they don't have to acknowledge sin. Right. Yeah. But you're trying to bring in your own peace. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because it's yeah. all about Me. how you work out. Yes. It, and that's that's a big thing. Like we can see this really from the beginning with children, right? Children are Adam and Eve. Like, did you break the vase? No. Mm -hmm. The cat did it, or my brother did. It. That's my Adam and Eve. Made me. Yeah. My brother knocked me. It's it's always the yeah. look away from me, right? And these religions like Buddhism actually facilitate that, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not the sinner. Right? Everything's suffering. All I have to do is not make it as bad. Mm -hmm. Right? Where in in Christianity we say no. You have to you have to come to that point where you realize you're a sinner. Right? That's the bad news of the gospel. The reason the gospel is called good news is because there's bad news. Mm -hmm. Right? The bad news is we're all sinners destined for hell. You can only change that. By accepting what has already been changed for us, mm -hmm. like we get to do that, um, and so, yeah. So the good morals type of things. And with the the peace that they get, what I've been learning a lot about, well, recognizing now is back when I was involved in drugs and worship of demon type behavior that demons can give you a sense of peace, but it's in your flesh peace. It's a temporary peace. It's not that inner peace you get from Jesus through the storm. It's like they calm the storm for you temporarily, or they dull your senses temporarily, so you have that. But it's always seemed to be temporary. So I don't get where they come up with this suffering will completely end. Because... Well, we could, again, it goes back to the... It might not be for you this time, but don't worry, you have another chance at it. Oh, okay. Like, because even if you can't fix it this lifetime, don't worry, you have another chance. I've seen the ones where they've, like, done a meditation state to where they've died meditating. Yeah. Is, is that because they're trying to 
get into that peace. Yeah, well, there's, there are levels of meditation. So those are, you're only going to find that in the monks. Okay. You're not going to find that in a typical person because they're not to that level yet. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, but this is, so this is a big thing. I, I just lost it. I had it and then I lost it. Oh, the peace. Yeah. So if you, I mean, if you think about it like this, if you've ever been in a situation where you had something pressing against you, right? Just like, um, um, I've been in like, so I used to do fighting. Okay. So I would have people like put their feet on my neck or we'd be grappling and they'd be like pushing on me. And it's like, you feel that pressure and then it gives a little bit. Mm-hmm. And that's when you're supposed to like move and do things. Right. Um, as soon as that pressure gives a little bit, you're like, like you can breathe again or something like that. That's spiritual oppression. Like you can feel this pain and then it just gives a little, it doesn't have to give a lot for you to be like, Oh man, now I'm at peace. Because if you've been suffering in a certain state for a long time, any release, even if it's the smallest release, is, oh man, I guess I finally broke broke mm-hmm. fr- through something. And it's not. It's just, just a little bit of reprieve. And right? adrenaline. Yeah. I don't know if it's just, well, my brother, he tried to kill me, and... He was smashing my head into the toilet, and it hurt so bad. But then I got to a point where it didn't hurt anymore. And then once it didn't hurt, I just laid there and I stopped fighting, and I just let him do it. And so I don't know if that was a sense of peace or if it was the adrenaline or if it was just like I was just giving up. Well, that uh, that stuff like when you you've had enough pain in your life that. It just doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt anymore. You know, I mean, it's just. Yeah. So we can we can experience that side of it too. Side of peace. Yeah. Okay. And it's not real peace. It's just. No, because inside I was miserable. Right. My physical. I right. had physical peace, but inside. Right. Yeah, I didn't have the Jesus peace. Right. Um, and so we've already talked through a lot of this. The differences. I mean, there's a lot, but just a few. Monotheistic God not Brahma, not universal force type stuff, sin, not karma, right? Um, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, so there's not karma. Um, heaven, eternity still as an individual, right? Because as a Buddhist, now this is really interesting because some Buddhists believe that, yes, you will actually be an individual. Like you can be individually, but you're still part of the thing. Where Hindus, no, you are completely God, right? So there is that kind of difference, um, but it's still your part of the cosmic force type of thing. So, all right, so uh, this is just a couple more. Um, how's it different? Hell, gray space versus workspace. Now, that's huge stuff because within these, these things of, uh, cycles, right? The, the cycle of life and death and things like that. There is no hell, right? There is no punishment in the sense of eternal. You know? And yet, on a Tibetan Buddhist temple wall, they have like seven layers of hell. Really? Yes, in circle. Like, yes, with all these paintings of torture and torment. That's interesting. They said, like, I think it was seven. I forget the number of layers exactly, Mm -hmm. but it's the layers, that's the levels of hell. That's interesting. It's in in Lhasa. I would really be interested in the development of that. And I don't know if it's eternity, like if it's just part of the reincarnation cycle, you go Mm. into there and come out. That's what I'm, I'm not sure of, but they definitely have the concept of in Tibetan Buddhism, at least at this particular, I think it was a Jokan temple, I think, but they have, they definitely have this concept there. On That's the really interesting. I would, I would really like to see the, when that developed. Yeah. And if it developed, developed after, because Christian missionaries have been there since like the 200s. I think it's like, 
at least I know in India it was real early, right? Like within the first century. Um, but I would be interested in like how that developed and then Christian yeah. missionaries, because that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I'm very curious about the connection between um, the prayer beads and burning. All right, three things of Roman, like you've got spaghetti, long noodles. You have beads, prayer beads. You have um, burning candles for people. All those are in Tibetan Buddhism, right? Too, and so it's like, or you know, in the Easter, you like the, and so it's like, was it Marco Polo? <laughs> like, <laughs> what's the connection? Is there a connection? Right. I've wondered that for years. Well, there's a lot of overlap in religious ceremonies and religious things. Um, like we talk about, like speaking in tongues is mm -hmm. a very common thing. Miracles, very common thing throughout all of religion. Um, stuff like that, meditation, these mm -hmm. types of practices. Um, and so I think that that is a part of just how do we visualize, how do we yeah. you know, do these things? Because incense, we see that in the... Yeah, incense is all over. Yeah. Can, so, can I ask altars. back a little bit on the sin is not karma just because they don't believe in sin? Well, we get, so sin... The concept of sin is rebellion against God's law. Right? That's, That's what's God. sin, yeah. So karma, though, is all about how what you pour into the universe, in a sense. Okay, so universe is basically their God. Or is it because you said heaven, eternity still is an individual, so that they are their own God? No, no, no. Or trying to become? No, no. So going back to that, that idea is in Christianity, heaven, you're an individual. Like, you're an individual in Christianity. You always will be. There is no difference right, in that sense. Like, Oh, that's Christianity. That, that, yeah. How is it different? In Christianity, we have heaven. Okay. Which is an eternity well, still. You said that they, they're like, I don't know if you're talking about Buddhist, Buddhism or Hinduism, when they were like, uh, they're totally just gone. That's Hinduism. That, that's Hinduism? Yeah. Okay, so... Like gone, like they don't exist yeah, at all. There's no individual. Oh. Yeah, you are gone. They're not just separated no. from existence or whatever. No, you okay. are brought back into the universal, the cosmic Brahma. Weird. Okay. Where in Buddhism, there, there's that, but then there's also the thing on the Buddhas, an individual state as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Alright, so the last thing is how do we reach out to Buddhists? Um, or what the Christian can take away from the Buddhists. Um, a respect for all living creatures. I think that's a, a very important thing. A li living a life that is seeking peace. We are to be called to be peacemakers, right? Like, um, we're called to live a peaceful life in front of the world. Like, we are called to peace. Um, so there is that connection there. Right, and the respect for all living things. Like as Christians, we are, we have the mandate of taking care of creation. So yeah, there is that idea. The difference is that we are also called to utilize the world, right? So if you're a hunter, that's not bad. Like it's not bad to be a hunter. You're like just just the idea of killing isn't. So in Scripture, murder is the issue, not killing. Mm -hmm. You know, and so senselessly. yeah, it's senseless violence is a problem. Justifiable violence, whether in war <coughs> or in feeding a family, that's different. Mm -hmm. And so, the respect for all living things, yes, but in Christianity, we say we utilize the things that God has given us with Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, those, yes, when the Buddhists, when we talk to Buddhists, we can agree on those things. Right? That, yes, I agree that we should be living at peace. I agree that we should have respect for living animals, you know, for the animals, for the world. I agree with those things. Um, the reasoning might be different. but um, So how can a Christian reach out to the Buddhist? Um, justice is a big thing. Like, for us as well, right? Like, mm -hmm. As Christians, we should be on the forefront of 
justice for all. <laughs> like that is what we should desire, right? It doesn't matter. That's why we actually talk about justice being blind, right? It doesn't matter your skin color, it doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter any of that. Justice for all, that is a biblical concept. Um, within Buddhism, there is a sense of justice, right? So we can talk about how, where's that idea of justice though come from? Why do you, why do you feel like they're suffering? Well, because people want their own desires. I agree. Why is that? There's a deeper reason, not just because there's a cause. What if we were created to be in a state of justice where everyone does good to each other? What if that's really the issue? Not that there's a cosmic problem in the sense of all is suffering, but what if all is suffering because it starts here, right? And to bring, because that's the big thing is, I can fix it, right? That's that's works-based religion. That's Buddhism. I can fix the problem of suffering. What if you can't? Mm -hmm. Right? What if all is suffering because no matter what you do, it just continues to bring suffering into the world? You know, so that, that's one of those things. It's just, okay. Uh, live out a godly lifestyle. Uh, a lot of people that I've encountered uh, will have the same, same thing against Christianity, which is, uh, Christians are just, they don't live up to what they say they do. That always is a problem, so we always, I just always bring that up. Um, be honest about struggles. Like, that's, I, um, I had a couple of conversations with a Buddhist, and um, in, in that, this idea of being honest was something that was hard to talk about. Because... Mm -hmm. When we, when we have workspace religion, and we see this in legalism, right? Legalistic Christianity. You can't be honest about your struggle. You can't, because that plays into the idea that you're not, you're not doing better. And so it's, I'll tell you my struggle. I'll be the one that says it. I struggle in this but I believe in a God who loves me this, in spite of that like that is a huge thing that I've encountered of, of just being honest you know I think that so. that plays a huge role in our entire walk with God and our repentant lifestyle if we can't admit openly that we are struggling with things, how can we be truthful with ourselves? Right. Well, but for a, a legalist or workspace, you can't. Because you have to almost trick yourself into thinking, I'm, I'm doing better than I actually am. Mm -hmm. But for a Christian, we should be the first ones that say, oh yeah, I'm a piece of junk without Jesus. You know? Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> so. And then dive into the uh, Jesus' teachings about being God. Like this is this is interesting because um, Buddha never talks about himself as being like the way, like mm -hmm. the one and only. Didn't you know? he say to seek truth? Yeah, and that's an internal thing, right? It's to seek truth, and what Buddhism has developed is that truth comes from within. It's subjective truth, mm -hmm. and it's. Should we seek truth, right? And here is a guy that says he is the truth. Mm -hmm. So why not give him an opportunity? Yeah, give him an opportunity to show you why he's truth and why actually Buddha. I I really this is this is my belief. If there is a Christian missionary standing next to that tree when Buddha came to that tree, mm -hmm. Buddha would accept the Christ because he was searching for something, yeah. but he had so much baggage from Hinduism that there wasn't that thing. Yeah. No. So I just, that, that's my thing. Uh, that's true or not. That's not. But it's just moving Jesus beyond the idea of him being a good teacher into the realm of what he is, which is the good God. So Buddha was a real person? Yeah, Siddhartha. Okay. At least that's the story. <laughs> so where we have, um, like there is no histo um, historian that it is worth anything 
um, atheist, agnostic, Christian, Muslim, you know, Buddhist. All historians basically say Jesus is real. Like he, the person of Jesus actually walked the earth. Did Buddha? That's actually a, a question. Is that even a real? So then, whose tooth do they take around in worship? Yeah. yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Um, because it's not like because in the Western world it was things were documented, mm -hmm. but in the Eastern world, I mean, there are things like uh, the, one of the biggest books for military from the Eastern world is. Um, Sun Tzu Ben Fa. Yeah. Um, um, what's it? The Art of War. The Art of War. Yeah. Yeah. They don't even know if that was a real person. Like the historical side of it is, it might look like. This was drawn together to be put into a book that was then, you know, attributed to a person. So there's a lot of questions of ancient Chinese um, history that maybe or maybe not, you know, especially ancient China. When we're talking about Buddha. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so every, we talked about every single worldview has to answer the seven questions. We started that at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So here's how the pantheist would answer these. Now, again, depending on the actual religion, it might be a little different, but these are general answers to these seven questions. The pantheists are a whole bunch of God believers? No, no, pantheists that are all things are God. Oh. Polytheists oh. are a bunch of gods. Yeah. Uh, so what is prime reality? Okay. So we would say God. Right? That's how the Christian would answer that question. God is prime reality. Right? Everything after that is what he created, so everything else is sub-reality, or reality that he creates. So God, for the Christian, God is prime reality. Okay? For the pantheist, it's not God, right? because God's not personal, right? nor is he singular. Right? It's the, it's the universe. So God is all through all and in all. So it's Everything, the universe is this prime reality. So that's how the, you would answer the question. The universe is prime reality. Matter is prime reality. It fits very well into a humanistic understanding of evolution, understanding of reality. Okay? Um, yeah. So, what is the nature of external reality, right? For the Christian, the nature of it is God created. Mm -hmm. right? For uh, the pantheist, it's the universe is a living, interconnected deity. Does that make sense? The world around us is just an interconnected deity. I'm stuck on the really real. <laughs> You were here last week, right? Like the Matrix. I keep thinking it's the Matrix. It, it, yes. We talked about that last week. It's very similar to that Matrix okay. idea. Yeah. I know. I, I In fact, there's a lot of Buddhist and Hinduist, Eastern pantheistic ideas within that story, within the Matrix story. Okay. They drew a lot from it. Wow, yeah. I did not know. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, what is a human being? Right? So this is the third question. What is a human being? For Christians, we would say they are the Imago Dei. Right? They are the image bearers of God. Okay? Um, for the pantheists, they might say human beings are parts of this divine being. Right? They might be manifestations of the divine being. Okay? So where we would say we're actually separate from God. God creates us very separately from us with characteristics of his, right? But we are separate beings and we are not deities. We are creations. And so last week when you were talking about, I'm just doing this to exercise my memory on that. Um, that was just the one, not the bad. About Hinduism. For them, all these gods are manifestations of the universe. Right. And that's why saying this also that's why it is pantheistic right yeah right exactly uh, so number four what happens to a person at death okay so now this would be more of what happened you know within a particular religion 
Uh, but mostly, it's human beings will either become one with the universe, that's the nirvana, that's the enlightenment side, or will reincarnate to advance closer to becoming one with the universe, or the reverse, D, um, advance. <laughs> you know, they go the opposite way. And that's, so that's their karma. That's the karma mm -hmm. aspect of it. That's the reincarnation cycle. Um, either moving closer to being one with the universe further or further away. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, number five. We have five and six. Um, so five. Why is it possible to know anything at all? The Christian would say because God creates the universe in a way that is logical, understandable. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's how we can know anything. So we can actually know that there exists a God just by looking around. Now, how do we know the specific God? That's through his specific work. All right, so that's how we have knowledge. So God gives us a brain to understand what he's created. Okay. For the pantheist, it would become through meditation on the interconnectedness of the, of the universe. You start meditating, and now you can open yourself up. So going back to that last airbender, Aang comes to this point where he's meditating and all he realizes he's connected all over the world. I think I said this last week. He's connected to all over the world and he actually knows what's going on to his friends when they're hundreds of miles away because now he's interconnected. So how does he know? Through meditation. That's kind of the idea. Okay. So is there a concept with meditation that you're opening yourself up for the universe yeah. to feed you, to speak so this, to you? This is kind of the chakras, the idea of chakras in Hinduism, <laughs> right? You open your chakras and you're actually exposing yourself greater to the universe. So you actually become one with the universe in that sense. It's actually opening up to Satan. So we would look at the astral Yeah, so we would actually say, no, 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 what you're actually doing because you're, you're emptying, right? You're actually opening yourself more to the, to the enemy than you were before. Right. So you don't see the existence of an enemy. Right. Not the same. Yeah. Not the same way we do. Now, now we to step step back for a second. You might start seeing within these things, like Hinduism, there are evil things, mm -hmm. right? Deities, demons, things like that. But it all comes back to it's all one. I, I, that's why I'm like so confused. How can they say to seek the truth yet go to this meditation of nirvana of emptying yourself? How can you because that is true completely and seek truth? Because that is the truth. The truth is that How you, can you seek but be empty. Because that's the idea. You have to seek this understanding seek of Brahma is truth. The universe oh. is what's so you have to get to that point where the truth, so this is how you would do it. The truth is that you are a part of Brahma, the universe. To become what you truly are, you have to release your individuality. That's the mm. truth. So you empty yourself of anything that would cause suffering in the sense of Buddhism. That emptying of self to move into another into Brahma, into your true being, mm. in a sense. But it fails to acknowledge the, the hopelessness of the evil of the human heart. Right. In that there's no way you will ever, ever be able to achieve that. Right. Because this is, so there's a cycle, right, of pantheism, where in Christianity we say, no, it's a linear. So that's one of those things where it comes down to one or the other is correct. Either we are in a cycle, and Christianity is false, or it is linear, and Hinduism, and any pantheistic belief system is false. Like those, That's one of those things where the exclusivity of Christ is extremely defined. Mm -hmm. Like Jesus saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except for me, is exclusivity. That's either true or it's not. <coughs> and then if Jesus would then be wrong. Right. So that's where you go, okay, so now follow the evidence. Is there evidence of Buddha? Well, so <laughs> this is actually, so this is something that we actually do. And um, I'll just, just real quick, um, since we're not going to get to the other thing anyway, so let's give you guys this. 
when I discuss um, God with people, there there's a series of of, um, of logical steps to it, right? The first step is um, there's only two options. Well, oh, there's three options. Let's put the three options. There's no God, right? This is atheism, right? There is God, singular, right, or personal, individual. Eyes. This could be polytheism. This could be um, uh, what you call it? Um, monotheism. So we'll just put theism. Right, and then there is the pantheism, right? All are God, right? So this is like Hinduism, all right? So I, when I'm talking to someone, we're, we're walking through the idea of, is there a God? This is what I'll bring up. There's either no God, God, or all things are God, right? Those are the three options. In this... What has to be there? Matter has to be eternal, right? Because there's no God. There's no other reality. So matter has to be eternal. This Because this is prime reality, right? Prime reality. Oops. Prime reality. Alright, so this is prime reality. Matter is eternal. God... You know, there has to be, so in monotheism, God is prime reality. In polytheism, um, there's actually matter is eternal. Right? So if you look into the Greeks, into the Babylonians, matter is actually always there. It's in chaos, is how it's described. Oh, yeah. If all things are God, matter is eternal. Right? So, out of these options, four of, or three of all the four, matter has to be eternal. Like, it has to be. The universe has to be eternal. Does that make sense? Yeah. Except it's not. What's great about, you guys have heard of Hubble. Mm -hmm. Hubble, right? Hubble. Two B B L E. Two Bs or something. Okay, so Sorry. with so the Earth is so wait, 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 close to the sun. No, no, no. Don't. Okay, okay. Nope, oh, we're not there. Okay, okay. We're just dealing with this first step. Matter has to be eternal, or it's not. One or the other, yeah. right? There are only two options. Either matter is eternal or it's not. What Hubble discovered is that the universe, the universe, is not eternal. Because what he discovered is the background radiation of the Big Bang, right? Of a moment where everything happened. Science calls it the Big Bang. Because it has to be eternal in both directions. Right. right. To be eternal, it right, has to eternal have no beginning. Right, or eternal. Like, yeah, eternal. We don't really fully grasp the term eternal when we're talking. Eternal is always there. Yeah. So the fact that there was this moment of time where the universe began to exist means that matter is not eternal. Mm -hmm. right. There's only one option left. There's a God. There's a God. That's the only option. Something outside of the universe created it. Now, you could say, well, it's an advanced aliens. Mm -hmm. Like, it's aliens. Mm -hmm. Or you can say we're in a matrix. That does not stop the thing that there was a creator. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And who, then you ask the question, who created the aliens? Right? Who created the ones that created the matrix? You have to get to this point where there is a prime deity. So now the question, so this is step one. This is step two. Step three is, okay, it has to be a deity. There's only three religions in the world that have a singular deity. Right? So step three is the three 
mono religions, right? And that's Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the three options. These two have the, all of them have the same belief in Genesis one. Okay, God created. So now, what what makes them different? Is that Judaism doesn't believe that Jesus is God? Right. So, Judaism doesn't believe that Jesus is God. Christianity says Jesus is God. And Islam says he's a prophet. Right? Mm -hmm. The difference is, is Jesus. So if Jesus says he's God, and he is, then... It doesn't matter that Judaism doesn't believe. Because he's actually their Messiah. Right? Mm -hmm. Islam is false. Completely right off the bat. Because he's God. He's not a prophet. He's God. And so, then, how can we prove that Jesus is God? So that's step three. Step four is the resurrection. Did it happen? The, um, what are they called? The things that happened that he fulfilled. Uh, we don't even have to go there. Because that can actually work for Islam too. Well, but that's the thing. This guy, was, I keep hearing, you know, I can't remember his name, he's famous, whatever. But he's like, who cares if Jesus was here? You know, who cares that he lived? Did he really get resurrected? Yeah. How do I know that? Where do I see right. that? Is? Because and the evidence is in the witnesses. For, well, it, there's a lot more than that. Oh. But First Corinthians 15 is the is did the resurrection happen or not? Because if it happens, it proves Jesus is God. It proves that the universe is eternal. It proves that He's the only way. If the resurrection doesn't happen, doesn't matter. Right. So this this so step one, we start with matter. That already just that idea of eternal matter um, takes off no God, polytheism, and pantheism. Just off the bat. All we're left with is monotheism. And if the resurrection is true, then Jesus is the only way. And we can prove the resurrection through things like the witnesses. Mm -hmm. right. in fact even people like Bart Ehrman though doesn't believe in the resurrection says something did happen to those early disciples to make them follow mm -hmm. to make them believe that the resurrection happened and also all of our our, our eyewitness or our testimonies our, right. our the, the problem with that though is that's 200 years removed we have to get, look at the yeah, we want it first. This is just a, a, a four-step thing. Did it happen? So we can go, Paul, who is an a ardent persecutor of the church, becomes a Christian. Peter, James, John, all these guys all were scared and then bold mm -hmm. in a matter of a day or a few days. And they all were led to death for a belief that, so this is one thing people say, um, people will die for something they believe is true. No one will die for something they know is not true. And uneducated. Yeah, they're uneducated. And man. Peter wrote, Peter, first Peter, second Peter, you would start reading that, you had no way. Yeah. No way, and, and uneducated. Fisherman, simpleton like Peter, mm -hmm. could have done that without the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, because he has a lot of things in there that are yeah. Old Testament yeah. that are right. are deep, deep theological. Things. So, but this is just something that's a four-step little process of it's an argument for the existence of God that just at step one you've already eliminated three quarters of belief systems in the world. Like you only get down to the main monotheists. Like in step one, or step two, technically. I love it. So that is just something, you know, we're talking about these different things. So Edward Hubble was a astro. Edward Hubble, yeah. 
it's like this this natural believing yeah. the nature is a god. Yeah. Um, so that's a wicked um, symbol. Yeah, that's what it's called. Um, and, <coughs> paganism. Ne- and neo-paganism. Yeah. So paganism is different than the neo-paganism that's practiced. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. So there's paganism, which paganism is just a term that Christians use for any religion that was not Christian. Mm-hmm. Neo-paganism is actually more of a naturalist religion, uh, very similar to animism. But it's with a lot of new age stuff that's mixed into it. That's how I looked so. it up, and I seen that it was like I didn't see neo paganism, but I looked at yeah. paganism. Because so in when we use terms like neo, it just means that's like scholarly, like okay, to differentiate from what we talk about in ancient world mm-hmm. is paganism. When we talk about in paganism today, we use I the term neo. Or the Christian idea of yeah. paganism either. So I just looked yeah. at that. That's why pain. we use the term pagan. For mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, and then the, the cards are the tarot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So, yeah. So next week we'll, we'll hit this. I'm going to try to hit um, occultism and deism um, right after each other so we can hit. Because from deism onward, you're going to see this kind of, I want you to see the breakdown from deism all the way into, at least, I hope we get to um, postmodernism. So if we can get to postmodernism, I think we're, we can, if we have to stop, then we'll stop. So a cult is going to have the, um, the new age in it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It will just have, again, it will just be like Greek mentions, but, mm-hmm. so, all right, we good? Okay, let's pray. Holy Father, thank you for this evening. Uh, thank you for the time that we've been able to discuss and talk. Uh, Father, I ask that you uh, soften our hearts, break them for those who are pantheists, um, especially those who are Buddhists, um, that we would be led to pray for them, that we be led to love on them uh, and point them back to you, um, that they would be broken of this need to fix uh, themselves and rather fall into your grace um, and know that they can be loved without being perfect um, and that you have a great a true destiny for them um, and perfect joy and peace with you in eternity. So Lord, uh, for us as we go home, that you protect us, that we could come worship you on Sunday, but then come and grow more together um, on next Wednesday. Um, that's all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.